today I'm going to talk a bit about a uh, soil carbon pilot that we ran uh, in this area here. So it was basically, we look, we're looking at a region sort of from almost to Cowra, sort of up to Manildra. Uh, and and it's, it's, we started this work back in 2009. And at that time, there was, there was no um, federal uh, government policy around this at all. So there was no carbon farming initiative. There was no, no emission reduction fund. And the key thing that we were sort of posed with a bit of work was, um, could we implement a soil carbon tra trading system if the government were to implement this as policy? So that's where we started from. And, and we, we had to go about how would you do that? So designing it, understanding sort of what worked, what, what didn't, um, and then implementing that I into a pilot that we then uh, rolled out in this area. And we've got a, some of our producers here today who, who've sort of taken part of that. Um, it was the first pilot on soil um, carbon sequestration in, in Australia at, at the time. And it was a multidisciplinary. So we, we got soil scientists, we had economists, we had uh, the extension people, all part of the same project and, and contributing to it. So it was, actually as far as the project goes, it was a really, really interesting one. Uh, and because you're developing something to get on the ground, uh, we had to make decisions very quickly and, and get across a lot of the complexity and work out how we we're going to deal with it. And the, the, I, I know that some of this has impacted, had impacts on, on how the government has, has developed their ERF prop policy and, uh, and, and the results of this are still uh, of ext extreme interest to this group, uh, to, to, um, to the federal government. I was in a, um, a VC with them uh, a couple of weeks ago and they're chomping to, to find out more about how, how the, uh, the carbon's changing on these sites. So um, it's still followed. So um, what we did was we, the first thing we did was we, we sort of designed a scheme around um, how, how, would we, how would we get producers to engage. And um, we came across, I guess, three different um, contract types. We had an actions-based contract where we used all the soil sampling that we had in the area. We used a little bit of soil carbon modelling and a lot of long-term data that have been collected in this area. And we said, well, what, what would the soil carbon levels be? What would we predict them to be uh, under three main things, conservation tillage, permanent pasture, and environmental plantings? And we developed a little tool that would say, well, where are your soil carbon levels now? And where we thought you, and how much, um, the rate of change we would expect to be. And then so we, with the action-based contract, we said, basically, if you did that action, we'd pay you the amount that, um, that we predicted that would change. And these are sort of the baseline soil carbon. So these are a stock of carbon. So when we're looking at this, uh, you're probably used to getting a carbon percentage in your soil carbon test that you get back from the lab. What we do with the stock is we are just calc um, using that carbon percentage by the mass of soil to work out the tonnes of carbon that are in the, in the soil. So here, so you'll see this a lot to, through this presentation is how many tonnes of carbon have we got. So this is just what we came up with for different, um, the standard practices. So conservation tillage about 38 tonnes, um, permanent pasture about 44, and environmental plantings we thought about 70. Um, but also you had to, they changed by about 30% depending on your texture of soil. So even in this little region where we tried to um, restrict this to the same soil type, our lighter soils, there are our sort of more loamy soils, were, we, we could adjust this value by 30% for those compared to our um, uh, light clays, which were 30% higher. So those 30% that we had to vary that just to, even within this relatively small little area. The um, second type of contract we had was an outcome-based contract. Um, this is where we basically would measure soil carbon at the um, beginning of the, the pilot period and then after five years, 
and we basically pay on, on what was sequestered over that period. This ended up being the most uh, popular contract because what uh, the producers who took part told us was it gave them a lot more flexibility. Uh, and they also said, we're doing, we're doing these things, we, want to do some, we need to do something else to, to take part in this because you need additionality, you need land management change, you can't just keep doing what you were doing. And so this is why the majority of our uh, uh, participants actually took up outcomes-based contracts. And then we had a hybrid-based contract, which is a half-half. So you did half uh, actions and half outcomes. And this is just uh, the area that we were working in and, and the rough distribution of the sites. Um, so this is uh, a diagram just basically showing what we did. But the key thing that I want to take away is the different phases. So I've sort of talked about this development phase. This is where we, we design and we put all that information together about how we'd run that pilot. Then we had this tender phase. So with the tender phase, we basically asked any um, producers who were interested in, in, in this area to uh, put in an expression of interest. Then the CMA at the time, the Lachlan CMA, um, sent staff out to go and meet with these producers, have a look at the site, assess that site to have how suitable it was. Um, and then that led through to a bid phase um, using a tool that we developed, um, then the appraisal, so a committee to actually independently assess those. And then we selected uh, the, the, the producers who were um, uh, most cost effective bids. So this was all based on how cost effective the bid was. Um, and then we contracted those which then led into this implementation phase. So that's basically where we baselined all the sites, even the action-based contract sites, and we went back at the end of the five-year period and we sampled those again uh, in 2017. And we calculated how much carbon had changed over that period, uh, finalised the contracts, and then just assessed all of that, that information. So that, that all finished in 2017, but this is a fantastic resource because of, A, we've, we've got sites that we've really well baselined. We've got engaged producers who are still really interested in what's happening. And so we've, we've basically got, come to this phase now where we're, we're starting to follow up. We're going back to these sites. And so what uh, was done through um, last, uh, last year was we, we actually went back and sampled um, these sites again to see how the carbon had changed since 2017. Um, we wanted to re-engage again with the, the participants of the site because a pilot ends and you sort of, uh, the interest mightn't end but, but the project sort of does. So we, we've, we've um, through Casey Proctor, we've, we've been getting in touch with the producers again. Um, and then we want to look at how those um, uh, soil carbon has changed since 2017. Um, so that we can basically understand these longer term questions that we're sort of talking about. Can you build soil carbon and, and how, like how viable is this as a method for, for you as producers? Um, and we also want to work in a uh, capacity building phase. So uh, a large part of this pilot was actually uh, working with the producers in this area to give them some basics around soil carbon so that they could make decisions about what they wanted to do as far as building soil carbon. Um, we actually think we need to revisit this. Um, a, there's new producers in the area who weren't part of this, uh, or, but we've also, um, things have moved on a bit from a whole farm emissions context, and so we need to put a lot of this work into a whole farm emissions framework because this, that's sort of how you need to assess this. You might need to um, account for some um, sequestration to offset um, some of the emissions that you might have as part of your, your, your business. So with that implementation phase, um, we had 54 initial expressions of interest. Um, and so the, we went out and at each of those, we not only just checked that the, uh, the, the staff didn't went out and checked to make sure that was, the paddock was on the soil type that we thought it was, that the bit of, um, validation that, that what the, the producers wanted to do was actually within the scope of what we were doing. Um, and then they took some soil tests. So what they did is they just got the old pogo stick out, um, took some zero to tens around the paddock um, and, and, and took those back. And that was to help us um, through the 
uh, bid assessment process. So what we did is we developed what's called a pedo transfer function between the um, carbon percentage of the zero to 10 to convert that to stock. So how much carbon is stored zero to 30 centimetres in the soil. And it worked pretty well because we had a lot of data for this area and we could predict that with about a 90% accuracy sort of uh, based on that. So we, we used that to help uh, estimate how much stock was there and then to, uh, that gave us a base to, to then uh, evaluate how we thought things would change. So the, the next phase of that was um, there was a large variation in the bid prices. And so this is what we call a, a supply curve. So basically what we did with the, the, the um, this is the, the total number of, uh, the cumulative amount of sequestration of carbon. And this is the, the carbon price uh, that each of those sites basically bid. And so what we're looking for is we basically just selected from this way until we hit our limit of how much funds we had to, to supply um, to, for, for the producers. And so we ended up, we, we had 11 sites that we could fund um, out of those 54 initial expressions of interest. And so this is exactly how a supply curve should work. You, you want the lowest quality bids, uh, oh, sorry, the, the best value bids down here. When they start getting up too high, then they're the ones that, that weren't funded. So one of the main things that was actually driving the cost effectiveness of bid was how much carbon they had in the soil at the beginning uh, or when, from those samples when, they, when we went out to assess the sites. So this is just actually looking at that carbon percentage here. And this is just uh, three levels that producers um, um, uh, progressed in, in the pilot. So this one is they applied and then they didn't go any further. And so what we found is most of these guys have sort of, on average, were up around 2% carbon. So when we looked at those bids, we would have said, okay, um, you've got no or, or, or very little opportunity to store carbon in that soil. So we would have given them back a value of their sequestration. They would have looked at it and said, well, it's not part, worth me being part of it for that site. So um, they, they didn't go any further. The next ones were the ones who, who put in a bid but weren't selected. So the guys who are above the line here. And again, their carbon was, was high. Um, higher than, than the sites that were selected, but say around here, I'll probably average about 1.7% carbon. And then the ones that were successful were down here an average of around 1.4. So that, that where you started actually uh, is, is a, was a key factor of this being a successful pilot because we select, purposely selected sites that had capacity to store carbon. And admittedly, there were some, some guys up here who, who had higher carbon levels, either they were on better soils, or they just wanted to be part of it, so they put in a, a cost-effective bid anyway. Um, and so there was still variation around each of these points, but that starting carbon value was a really key part of, um, of, of, of the pilot. So uh, this is probably a, a bit... Um, bit much detail, I should, should have looked at this one on a big screen in front of a room before I put it up. Basically, these are the 11 sites uh, and there was, they were all doing something um, a bit different. But they came, we, we could classify these up into a few different land types that, that, um, that they were doing. And the key things that they were doing was um, sowing pasture from cropping, so going from cropping to pasture, which is the pea sites. The organic matter was where they were using uh, either compost or biosolids, which was the main organic matter that people were putting on. And the CR is just basically improved cropping practice. So, um, and all the sites sort of could be roughly were, were cropping or pasture and then plus or minus biosolids. So we, we roughly had that matrix of sites to look at. So we can break that down and then start to look at how those different land uses actually impact on sequestration. Um, over all the sites, um, there was nearly 10,000 tonnes of, of carbon dioxide equivalents stored uh, over that five-year period. That was about 2,000 tonnes higher than what we predicted. So it was like we were very happy and, and, and really uh, amazed at the result actually once we, we went back and resampled those. And, and I think part of the, 
The reason it was successful was because we had started with those sites that we knew had capacity and we really, um, I guess, only selected methods that we knew had science, scientific credibility to back up to store that carbon. So um, those two things meant that, yes, there were, we could actually, we, we did store a reasonable amount of carbon over those five year periods. <coughs> so um, what was the, um, the rates of change? Because this is sort of what you, uh, I guess, really determines uh, are paid on um, if, if you were entering into these schemes. So if we just look at the, the land use here, we can add up all the organic matter versus the, the sites that didn't have that. Um, so the actual rate was about 0.78 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year for the biosolids uh, uh, compost. Compared to the sites that didn't have those, they were about 0.42 tonnes. So yes, there was a benefit from putting on that, that organic matter. Um, a little bit different to what we predicted, but, but not too bad. And interestingly, we, we actually didn't have any data around biosolid application to, to make a prediction about that. So we just had to use an expert opinion on what we thought it was. Then we had the cropping compared to the perennial pasture. And so we, we did, uh, the, the cropping practice was actually pretty low, um, but the perennial pasture was probably a bit better. And I think when we went back and looked at this and reassessed this after we, we, um, we got these results back, we were often using data that was quite old around cropping, where this, the, what we were comparing it to was four cultivations over summer, uh, then sowing, um, and, and so in those uh, instances where you're retaining stubble and, and, and improving crop and practice, it was actually, there was a, a reasonable benefit. But um, the other thing that we often didn't know is because we didn't have good starting values is we weren't sure whether that was a reduction in the decrease or whether there was an increase in, in soil carbon. And a lot of the literature had said that often with cropping, we're actually just reducing the amount we decrease carbon by through that cropping phase rather than increasing it, actually increasing it through a carbon phase. And when we look at the one site that was just pretty much all they did was, uh, was they um, improved their cropping practice. They used some GPS guidance, some better stubble retention, a, a few other things. It, it actually did, it was the one site that didn't store carbon over that, that period of time um, where all the other practices w w did. So, so we have a little bit of a, a comparison to, to compare that to. So we got these results back after five years and we thought this is fantastic. <laughs> um, but as I sort of put up before, this is another version of the graph that I, I put up in my previous presentation. This is sort of what we expect with soil carbon. You have these little bits of, you have this initial increase, then you hit a period of time um, before you, you have an equilibrium. What we, what we don't know often is what is the shape of these curves? And because we have variation due to, se due to season and, and due to how people implement these management practices, it's not always as neat as this. This, is, this comes out of a model. And so a lot of our sequestration that we were looking at was just sort of average probably over a little bit longer period of time than that initial five years. And so the other part of why we overestimated, um, uh, why the sequestration rates probably did better than what we thought was, they were in that really um, sharp early phase of, of increasing, um, which then tends to peter out a bit over time. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the this is just the relationship between um, the soil carbon percentage actually from those initial um, uh, tests that we took and then the soil carbon stocks that we measured over the same time. So the reason I wanted to put this up is um, I actually think that these your use of your zero to 10 soil samples can be uh, very important for predicting soil carbon. So there's, you've probably heard, uh, if, or if you've been reading stuff in the, in the media about this, there's a lot of people trying to predict soil carbon from satellites. Um, one of the things is you can't, see what's, you can't see what's below the surface. So all a satellite can do is looks at the vegetation or, and what's on the surface and uses a proxy to try and predict what's happening below the surface. Um, you can't see that. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to feed in some of the soil kit test data that is cheap to collect and you're collecting on a regular basis to help improve that type of approach. 
And so here, just simply from, from the data we collected, um, we, we know that uh, we're explaining about half the variation in stock just from that zero to 10, 10 uh, centimetre um, soil test. And we could probably explain a lot more if we start adding in soil type and texture and a few other things. So um, I think there's an opportunity where we're heading because soil sampling is so expensive and time consuming that if we're really going to start to uh, get serious about including soil carbon, we'll actually be moving to an approach where we're predicting it. Um, so in this follow-up phase, um, as I mentioned, we've, we've gone and um, sampled the, uh, uh, the stocks um, again last year. We're just at the point of um, getting this data back from the, the lab. So we, I think, it, I'm not sure it's all back, but it's just about all back now. Um, and we're just looking through that data and we want to get that um, back to the participants soon. So that's going to be the next step is we actually give all this data back to the people who've taken part and walk through with them to uh, what, what that data actually looks like uh, for their site. Um, but to interpret that, we really need to understand what's happened um, since 2017. So how has the management changed uh, on these sites? Um, because that's uh, a really key part to, to, to interpreting what the change is um, between 2017 and last year. Um, and then we'll determine the changes in, um, in greenhouse gases. So what we want to then do is, is not only look at this from a soil carbon perspective, but look at this as if you were to do this as an ERF method where you actually have to take into account the animal emissions, nitrous oxide emissions and everything else, uh, what would this CO2 mitigator look like, not only over that first five year period, but over a 10 year period. Um, and then as I mentioned, help uh, engage with producers in the region to understand their net greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon. And most importantly, to deter help determine pathways for people to uh, reduce their emissions on farm. So um, this is just the average of all the sites. So it's an average of an average. It's, it's the average of 30 centimetres and the average of all sites that, um, that we sampled. And so we had this um, quite, I suppose, a reasonable increase in carbon from the start of the pilot to the beginning. What we've found is we have, uh, that's, at most sites has either stayed flat or has come back a little bit. And so we've, we've got a bit of work to do to understand why that's happened. So we, um, the farmers had no obligation about how they manage that, that, that area, so we don't know yet how that's been managed, and that's sort of, we're, we're in this process of trying to understand that land management data to see if it, part of that, explain that is actually, they've changed what they were doing um, compared to that uh, period. We've also had um, a, 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 some interesting set of seasons. We, uh, after 2017, we had two of the driest years on record, uh, followed by, uh, three of the wettest, so um, we, we really don't know how that seasonality has impacted on that. Um, so there's a few things that have gone on that have, um, uh, we, we need to understand uh, to try and interpret that data. Um, and when we look at where that, that change is occurring, most of the carbon at depth, so that was stored at 0, 10 to 20 and, and 20 to 30 centimetres has been stable. So we haven't seen a decrease on average at, at, with that carbon. Most of the change has been at the soil surface. So this is just early days. I just wanted to put it up as an indication of what's going on, but we've got a lot more work to do to understand um, what's going on with all of this. So in summary, um, the pilot demonstrated it was possible to use an MBI to pay farmers to change management to increase soil carbon. So it was very successful from, from that point of view. Um, we stored nearly 10,000 tonnes of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents after five years, which was basically 2,000 tonnes higher than what we thought we, um, we predicted we could um, store. Um, participants with low soil carbon had, had the greatest potential to, store, uh, to sequester carbon and had a competitive advantage. And we think that that was a large part of the success in seeing that sequestration in those early years. Um, but we need to put that initial success into context with the, the longer term um, sequestration, which is what we're trying to do now. 
and the whole farm emission changes in, uh, with land management also need to be considered, which is the other bit that we're working on now. So I'm putting this up. This is your opportunity um, if you want to get involved. Um, we're putting out an expression of interest for producers in this area who want to be part of um, understanding their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so what we're looking for is, is basically mainly mixed farming businesses uh, who are, are really interested to understand more about their greenhouse gas emissions. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a, um, a series of workshops over about an 18 month period. Um, what you'll get out of it is we will baseline the emissions on your farm. We'll give you uh, uh, some guidance from experts around the ways that you can reduce emissions on your farm. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, uh, I guess uh, and do that in, in, this, in the context of how things are going to change. And what we would like to get back from this is, is basically an understanding of what you want to do and, and why you want to do it. So we're trying to use that type of information to better guide how these systems will, will be developed into the future. So this is uh, a, a project that's funded by MLA and the federal government and is um, being led by, the whole project's been led by Richard Eckhart at Melbourne Uni um, and, and we're working closely with him uh, on that bit of work. So if you're interested, um, Phil's got some forms over here. You can just write um, your name, contact details and a little bit about your business and um, we can, uh, we'll get, get in contact and, and let you know. So we, over the next month or so, we're going to be sort of asking a number of events uh, for people who are interested. So even if you're not interested yourself, you know other people who you think might be, um, get them to get in contact and uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we're after a number of businesses that we can sort of involve in this process. Thank you. Right Thank you, Warwick. Terrific, colleagues.